Hello and welcome to today's program, which asks if Korean unification has indeed become a fading prospect. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Jonathan Corrado, and I'm the Director of Policy here at the Korea Society. And I'm joined by my colleague, Chelsea Alexander. Good morning, Chelsea. Morning, Jonathan. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, our guests today are all rock stars. Two are returning to our program, and one is new. It's my pleasure to introduce them. Dr. Nicholas Eberstadt is the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute, where he researches and writes on demographics and economic development, as well as on security in the Korean Peninsula and Asia. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for inviting me. You spoke last year at a very popular program uh, exploring the causes and consequences of South Korea's shrinking birth rate, uh, an issue which has only become more important recently as news emerged that the fertility rate, rate shrank again. Yeah, so we're very glad to have you back this morning. Uh, Jungmin Kim is the lead correspondent at NK News and editorial director at Korea Pro, based in Seoul, South Korea. Recently, you could see uh, Jungmin Kim uh, resurface on Twitter for her fantastic comedic performance on SNL Korea. So, Jungmin, I hope we don't lose you to the comedy world because you made a, uh, a pretty good showing there. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you joined us for a great program in 2022, exploring possible futures for North Korea. And then again, for a programming forecasting the 2022 Korean presidential election. We are so happy to have you back. Dr. Sang Shin Lee is a research fellow and director at, of the Center for the Study of Liberal Democracy at the Korea Institute for National Unification, KINU. We've been paying close attention to your fantastic research, but this is the first opportunity to welcome you as a guest to the Korea Society. Welcome, Sang Shin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So before I turn it over to our panelists, I want to thank the Korea Foundation and our corporate sponsors for making this program possible. We are taking your questions live. Please send those in to policy at koreasociety.org. All right, let's jump on in. Jungmin, we're going to start with you. We're going to get your PPT going. Um, so we're going to turn to you for the big picture, looking at the situation. Kim Jong-un makes the announcement that North Korea's longstanding policy goal of unification, one nation, two systems, has been dropped. Some analysts are urging us to interpret this as a <coughs> policy shift. Others say it's just a simple recognition of the reality. In explaining Pyongyang's hostile shift, South Korean unification minister has pointed to four factors. One, domestic economic struggles. Two, the surging popularity of South Korean Hallyu media, media. Three, seeking attention before the U.S. election and South Korean election, I might add, and justifying its nuclear program. Jungmin, over to you for your thoughts and analysis of what exactly is going on here. Hi, my name is Jungmin Kim. I actually wrote an analysis immediately after the North Korean uh, announcement in January at the time. Thank you, Jonathan, for reading it and inviting me to talk about this. Um, but it's been a few months and a lot happened uh, in the meanwhile. So let me review just very quickly uh, what the main argument was, what the main rhetoric was, and what happened afterwards, like you asked. Um, the, the core of Kim Jong-un's argument on December 31st was that unification is no longer possible. It's an impossible goal. Um, and I would like to uh, review what kind of North Korean statements and announcements later on followed up on that. Um, next slide, please. If you look at this KCTV uh, footage, it's actually a good summary of what's going on right now after the announcement. You can see that they no longer show the entire Korean peninsula, but they drew a line in between South Korea and what they call ROK now um, and, and North Korea. Um, and the gist of the argument, the new new policy line, Rosong, is that uh, South Korea is now a... Um, a belligerent foreign state and they want to get rid of the concept of minjok and they actually followed up with that in a very physical manner we could see we broke the story on uh an, the satellite imagery hints of the arch of unification going down and other symbols going down as well including the websites including the term minjok um they changed the korean peninsula photos like this or images and the foreign ministry not uh the 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 department related to inter-korean unification have moved very fast, almost even less than a day after Kim Jong-un's announcement to get rid of the departments and organs related to the inter-Korean relations. So they are really treating South Korea as a foreign state, just like they mm -hmm. do with other countries as well. Um, and it, it, this part is very underreported, but the Kim Jong-un's uh, speech also involved this a long paragraph about how 
um, the minj- the concept of minjok, the compatriot, it should be eliminated from the political culture. Uh, from this, I judge that maybe their target audience was the domestic audience and North Korean people, that the message is for them largely as well. But looking at how so far for the past few, two months, they did not report in state media or any photos, any videos, any text about getting rid of the Arch of Unification, for example. It seems like maybe they're a little bit cautious about uh, people blaming Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il directly perhaps or looking like they are but the core argument still is that they worked on it um the three kims worked on it but it didn't work next slide please and the thing we have to keep a very close eye on is uh also the illicit border argument and this may come up very soon um in uh, more development in north korea uh kim jong-un asked the military to prepare for potentially subjugating south korea and they said the nll north northern limit line is illicit and hinting potentially at pushing it down or at least rhetorically trying to claim it uh claim the region south of the maritimes the current de facto maritime border and this is something the not only south korea but also united nations command and u.s has to keep a close eye on as well because it immediately um influences their role as well but it, so far until v- this morning as well uh it seems like uh, north and south korea are both being very cautious about this on uh, north korea's end they will be doing a constitutional amendment this spring we have to ver- keep a very close eye on how they actually define the new border um, but i will leave it to dr lee to explain this a little more um, on the South Korean end, interestingly, um, the Freedom Shield, the springtime U.S.-South Korea joint drills is going on. And I went to the briefing uh, talking to the JCS and the USFK head of press offices, and I, I asked them if they will be resuming border drills, and they said no. Um, it seems like they are also very aware of the possibility of increased um, risk at the border, like skirmishes. And it's it looks like both sides are trying to not escalate something too quickly. But um, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, but this part has been interpreted in various ways, um, including uh, uh, some of the viral columns out of DC. Uh, but Kim Jong-un didn't say that they will, North Korea will be subjugating South Korean territory immediately. It was caveated um, only to, you know, prepare to subjugate South Korea if needed. And it seems this is continuing, uh, judging from the defense ministry statement yesterday from North Korea. It was the first formal response to the Freedom Shield. And their main point was very interesting. They said that our soldiers are so busy um, doing economic construction in the rare. We cannot really respond to you right now. This is new. Very interesting. It was up in economic articles before, but not in military articles. Um, So this is interesting. And it seems that they are trying to position themselves as someone that's escalating at the border and trying to, you know, build up the justification to say that U.S. and South Korea is the axis of evil. That's not doing a defensive drill. Um, next slide, please. For the coming weeks and months, something to look keep a close eye on is that um, North Korea claimed that, said that they're disappointed at both left and right in South Korea. Um, it, it depends on interpretation, but it seems, first of all, it seems they are hinting that they're not interested in someone winning in presidential or general election in South Korea, be it DP or PPP, or, and or, uh, it could be an expression related to how they were so disappointed with um, how they feel betrayed uh, by the Moon Jae-in administration in the previous, uh, you know, during the Hanoi summit and all. Um, And I wonder what uh, Dr. Lee and Dr. Everstadt thinks. And finally, next slide, please. Um, I haven't written about this yet, but I wonder if this has something to do with the next generation. And I wonder if they will link this unification is impossible rhetoric to link it to the, you know, the justification for the fourth Kim in North Korea. When Kim Jong-un's daughter uh, was first introduced, the justification was that the nuclear weapon and the ICBM is for the new generation, like the daughter. Um, I wonder if Kim Jong-un will link the unification abandonment thing to um, how this is something good for the next generation in North Korea so that they don't get roped into this impossible dream of unification and that they will only seek um, 
ways to secure security and economic prosperity for North Korean residents. I wonder if they will actually link to that. And if so, it will link, link, uh, lead to an ideological basis, perhaps, for the fourth Kim as well. And I will leave you there. Jungman, thank you so much. Excellent analysis and so much food for thought. And I hope I could tee up some of our uh, other speakers, Sangshin and Nick, for some additional follow-up here. But just to prime the pump a little bit, what got me thinking was this contested border in the NLL and the West Sea, such a historic flashpoint where we have seen conflict before. Of course, the sinking of the South Korean naval corvette, the Chunan, then the bombardment of Yeonpyeongdo. Um which resulted in South Korean fatalities, right? This time, mm -hmm. uh, less uh, willingness on the South Korean side to just absorb those losses and, and remain quite calm. Uh, we also saw that interpreted as building up Kim Jong-un's bona fides at the time uh, before he came right. age as later. So wondering what types of military provocations could help, as you suggested, similarly pave the way for a future North Korean leader. Also remarkable, the shift away from unification in as much as previous generations of Kims have used it as a basis for their own legitimacy. And mm. the ethnic Korean people, the claim to be the rightful legitimate representation of all Korean people on the entire peninsula, such an important Kim family claim to that legitimacy. Um, and then finally, your remark about soldiers being busy. This is another remarkable one because, A, we could see how Kim Jong-un really wants to point to his economic construction development as a way to build up his um, constituencies and support domestically. Uh, but it's also a, a, a very startling admission that the soldiers are more busy and more needed building new homes and apartments and roads and exactly. bridges. And not That's why it's surprising the that the military is saying it. Yeah, very, very. And we knew this was going on, but for them to say so, right, is pretty, exactly. pretty startling. Okay, so uh, uh, offering some opportunity here to Sanction and Nick to provide some commentary. Yes, I have some quick comments. Uh, before important elections in South Korea and the United States, North Korea has always um, done some crazy things to escalate tensions. So I'm not that surprised to see the same thing happening again. Many experts, including Jung Min and South Korea's Minister of Unification, interpret this change in North Korean policy as a sign of internal conflict or struggle. However, I think the opposite interpretation is also possible. With this policy change, Kim Jong-un has repudiated the legacy of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, the foundation of his power. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim Jong-il has been North Korea's supreme leader for 13 years and now middle-aged. He may now feel that his power is stable enough that it is okay to step out of the shadow of his grandfather and father. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe that's why he is doing it. Yeah. That's one thing, but it is. it doesn't mean that he may be wrong or right. Maybe Kim Jong-un is believing his, his power is secure, but maybe he doesn't know what is really happening in his country. But that's my comment. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Sanction. Uh, Nick, any thoughts on this one before we move on? It's, uh, it seems like a really important uh, watershed set of doctrinal changes in DPRK. And... We always, uh, as Americans or South Koreans, look at what North Korean pronouncements or behavior mean to us. Um, and as Sangshin was saying, we might also be looking at what it means to DPRK leadership and DPRK society uh, as well. We receive the external broadcasts or pronouncements, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, from DPRK, we don't get the domestic uh, readout of this. Yeah. And that's a big lacuna that would help us understand uh, how this is being um, how this is being explained to the domestic population, the subjects. Uh, what, what strikes me um, as uh, thought-provoking and fascinating is that 
changes in North Korean doctrine are not done with a sudden abandon. Yeah. Uh, there's an enormous amount of thought and care that goes into doctrine, pronouncements, propaganda, whatever you wish to call it. And deciding that one is going to make a break with um, Kim Jong-il is not so surprising because he was widely reviled even within North Korea as a terrible emperor, not just a monster, but also a very bad ruler. But making the um, making the break with grandfather, with the foundational figure, yeah. um, suggests indeed, as Sanshu says, <laughs> more than a little confidence about yeah. uh, about control and command and uh, and the vision for the future. So that that part of it seems to me really interesting. Of course. Um, of course, separating uh, separating the two Koreas conceptually doesn't preclude uh, an eventual unification by absorption or a unification by accession, as uh, as Jung as Jung Min was uh, mentioning. Uh, that possibility is still on the table, but there's also the other question of: Is this going to lead to a possible change in military doctrine as well? Is this yeah. going to lead towards something more like a defense sufficiency approach? On the one hand, North Korea is uh, still developing the sh uh, short-term uh, missiles that would be necessary for fighting and winning a limited nuclear war in the peninsula. But on the other hand, they're selling supposedly up to 3 million artillery shells to the Russians, which would be kind of a frontline uh, front yeah. necessity. So. Yeah. Still a lot of questions about uh, where this takes us uh, with respect to security. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. And uh, Jungman, any uh, final thoughts on this one before we move it on? Yes, I forgot, I forgot to mention something uh, listening to the comments. I just remembered that uh, one of the... Um, one of the consensus that I got when I was um, interviewing experts was that this change, well, first of all, ideology is very important in North Korea. It's not to say that it's just an ideology. It's a basis yeah. of yeah. North Korea's hereditary dictatorship. And um, for them, uh, many experts pointed to how um, the getting rid of South Korea as a compatriot sort of equation is actually very useful ideologically for them to continue developing nuclear warheads that can be loaded to short range ballistic missiles that can um, aim at South Korea because there is an ideological uh, dissonance if they continue to do that without getting rid of it because you are trying to fire um weapons of mass destruction towards a compatriot just really doesn't make really that much sense as a coherent ideology. So maybe they were right. trying to get rid of that just to make it more convenient. Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, thank you so much, Jungman. And, and now we're going to move on to Sangshin. And of course, unification, it takes two to tango. So let's look at what South Korea is thinking. Sangshin, can you give us a sense for recent changes in South Korean public opinion towards unification? Are you sensing any prominent demographic or ideological splits? And why do you think there seems to be less enthusiasm now for unification than in years past? Thank you for the good questions. Uh, I'm a polling guy in South Korea. <laughs> I'm in charge of the KINU's annual uh, public opinion survey, which is called the KINU Unification Survey. I prepared some slides for you. Let's move on to my slide. Next slide, please. Uh, we can sk skip this one. Next one. Okay. In South Korea, as in North Korea, unification is no longer a popular idea. In 2023, the Kino Unification Survey found that about 54% of our respondents said unification is necessary. So that's about only half of South Korean population. Half of South Koreans still say the unification is necessary. But as you can see from the graph, uh, the graph shows the number of re respondents who agreed that unification is necessary is slowly decreasing. Next slide, please. But the former question is kind of tricky because for average Korean, there is a psychological resistance to admitting that unification is not necessary. 
So unification in South Korea is a moral issue. So I measure attitude toward unification with several different questions. This one is one of my favorite. It uh, shows the statement. It gives the respondent this statement. If South and North Korea uh, can peacefully coexist without war, the unification is not necessary. So there is a condition for the non-necessary unification. What if North and South can peacefully coexist? Then do, do you still think unification is necessary? And as you can see, we have very nice breakup here. Over time, the more people say that unification is not necessary as long as we have peace with North Korea. So I think that is more revealing than wow. the first questions. Yeah. And for the 2023 survey, of almost 60% of South Koreans says that unification may not be needed in case we have peace with North Korea. Only 22% says that unification is still necessary. Next, stri next stri slide, please. And this one ask about the national region. Uh, another statement, just because North and South Koreans are one people does not mean they must form one country. Uh, I ask this question because the official South Korean unification plan is called National Community Unification Formula. Why do we need unification? The formal official uh, explanation for the reason for the unification is that because North and South Korea are the same ethnicity, national region. But national region is uh, fastly losing ground among South Koreans. Mm. In 2023, about half of the people says that uh, they agreed with this statement. The nationalism is no longer uh, giving the justification for the necessity of unification for the South Korean people. Mm. Next slide, please. So another one. Uh, if South and North Korea open the borders to each other and cooperate on political and, and economic matters, such a state can be considered unification, even if the two, the two Koreas are not one country. Uh, for this statement, I try to explain uh, the what confed confederation is looks like. Uh, as you know, the national a community unification plan based on the EU model, confederacy of the various European countries. What if South and North Korea can peacefully coexist and forming kind of the community, not without becoming one country or EU style, the confederacy, would you accept that as a unification? With this question, I try to measure how people feel about the alternative concept of unification. Yeah. Unification doesn't necessarily to be a unitary, a single state solution. Maybe EU style, confederacy type unification can be accepted by the South Korean public. And as you can see from the graph, many 55% uh, of South Koreans in 2023 survey agree with the statement. They are willing to accept the confederacy concept of unification as an alternative unification. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So that now in South Korea, many South Koreans have different ideas. They are ready to accept the, uh, the changed concept of unification, and they are losing fast. They are losing their uh, interest in unification. Uh, with the con conflict escalated with North Korea, we have uh, the different attitude toward North Korea. The following graph shows the region, uh, the, the fastly changing South Korean public's uh, negative feeling toward North Korea. And as you can see, not many people says that they are interested in North Korea. In 2023, only one third of South Korean public says that they are interested in North Korea. 
Next slide, please. If South Korea lowers its guard, North Korea is always ready to attack. Mm. And, and in 2023, uh, you can see the increase in the negative attitude to North Korea. 60% of South Koreans agree with this statement. They now view North Korea as a potential enemy. North Korea is ready to attack South Korea. Next one, please. Another one. One North Korea wants is regime stability and economic development rather than communist unification. Let's look at 2019. At that time, it was right after the failure in Hanoi. Even after the failure in Hanoi, half of the South Korean public still believed that North Korea didn't want communist unification. They want economy, economic development, regional stability. Now people are changing their mind. About one third, one fourth of South Korean public disagree with the statement. They now believe that North Korea truly, truly want communist unification. So negative feeling toward North Korea increasing. Next one, please. Another statement, North Korea wants peace with South Korea, then conflict. Again, in 2019, right after the Hanoi failure, still half of South Koreans believe that wow. North Korea's true aim was peace. Now the picture, was, uh, very di picture is very, very different. Almost the same proportion of South Koreans. 23% of South Korean public agree with this statement, while the almost same percent of percentage of people says that they they disagree with this statement. They believe that North Korea do not, does not want peace with South Korea. Next one. Oh, no. <laughs> that, that end my uh, <laughs> presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the overall, the unification is losing popularity among South Koreans. And the negative feeling toward North Korea is increasing. So that's not a good sign for the unification. But uh, the nationalistic feeling among South Korean is dormant, but nationalism is always a very powerful uh, force to drive people into the uh, unification. Maybe some popular populistic South Korean leader, maybe the change of North Korean stance will drive nationalistic feeling among South Koreans again. I don't, I don't think I can rule out that possibility. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Sangshin. That, that was really fascinating and learned a lot. Um, I'm t very tempted to speculate about the reasons why things are changing in the way that they are. And I can hazard a guess, but I want to invite um, your uh, analysis and that of Nick and Jungman as well. Uh, my knee-jerk reaction is to look towards internal and external factors. So externally, you know, this declining interest in unification maps very nicely onto North Korea's first, the post-Hanoi failure, but then the strategic shift by Pyongyang away from trying to achieve that normalization with the U.S. and South Korea and towards the embrace of China and Russia, right? So like if we were to put those two trends next to each other, then yeah, they would pretty much match up. And then of course in South Korea, um, particularly the younger generation, just lacking these types of familial uh, ties to the North that previous generations had and fond memories of uh, of a time before the country was divided, uh, growing up during a time when North Korea was nothing but a nuisance. Uh, so having much different views towards North Korea and then just self-interest in their own economic situation. So those are my uh, speculations, but I, I hope to, to hear from you as well. Yes, I agree to just everything you just said. Uh, there are mostly the internal reasons why South Koreans are losing interest with unification. And one of the big reasons is that if you do achieve unification, especially South Korean younger generations are afraid that they, they would be the one who pay the price for the unification. I yeah. think that uh, yeah. Nick will uh, talk about <laughs> that, the price of unification. <laughs> so, but the younger generation uh, for for, for the younger generation of South Korea, North Korea is just a, another foreign country. Right. 
which is exactly what Kim Jong Un says about South Korea. <laughs> he defined, de defined South Korea as another foreign country, just like South Korean young generation is yeah. doing with North Korea. Uh, with the uh, Kim Jong Un's new test for the unific unification, South Koreans are not really surprised. But uh, we, we we take that as kind of escalated tension between North and South Korea. So we are worried about the possible conflict, possible skirmish between South and North Korea. But it, the, in reality, unification, it, uh, the changing North Korean policy on unification it does not really change anything in South Korea. Right. Okay, wonderful. Um, Nick and Jungman, open to you for any additional thoughts here. These are really wonderful slides. They're really informative. Um, the, the slide that, um, that arrests me in particular is the declining interest in DPRK in the South. And it reminds me, um, in a way, of, of, of a saying in Japan uh, during, you know, during the lost generation of uh, economic growth, that the U.S. had gone in its uh, views towards uh, Japan from Japan bashing to Japan passing to Japan nothing. And this is kind of like where we get to the North Korea nothing uh, stage of the program here for uh, for South Korean opinion. I'd like to ask you, Sangshin, if you could tell us a little bit more about the generational cleavages in opinion here. You'd already kind of hinted at this, but if we looked at your various slides, how would young South Koreans skew uh in relation to the overall averages, I, ha I have a guess, but I'm curious about the the generational differences in opinions here. Uh, yes, uh, I I'd, uh, I must add one thing with this slide. As you can see in the slide, uh, it uh, I started the survey in 2015, and. Uh, we have many things happened between South and North Korea. In 2018, there was a several summit between South and North Korea. North Korea con conducted nuclear tests and the failure of Hanoi and many, uh, many good and bad things in North Korea. And even with all those things, you can see the very steady trend in decreasing interest in North Korea. That's, I think, very interesting. And why younger younger generation of South Koreans are losing interest in North Korea? Uh, I think it, it, the, the older gen, my generation view North Korea as a bad young open brother, like who do drugs and always drunk and beat, beating up people, but he is still my brother. <laughs> if he got beaten by the some thug of the town, I would be angry. I still care for my little brother. That's an but amazing the, quote, Sanction. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but yeah, look, for the older generation, North Korea is a black sheep of the family. We, I, I hate him, but he is still my brother, my responsibility. But but younger generation, not they see North Korea as just a oh, news. They 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 are sick and tired of North Korea. They don't see any gains, any uh, possible prosperity and peace with North Korea. They don't know they don't know why we have to achieve North Korea achieve unification in North Korea. I think uh, we have different frame perspective on North Korea uh, among the generations in South Korea. Wonderful. Uh, as, a, over to you. as a young South Korean, <laughs> who's sure? uh, ish um, still, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just going to add some color to, to, to the polls. I have various friends of same age in different industries, uh, different interests, different career, um, and they don't read North Korea news as closely as we do. Um, they see North Korea from impressions and headlines, urgent alerts, stock price going down. 
Um, and they grew up not having so much of a direct um, exposure to what North Korea is like because there was not much North Korea engagement going on while we were adults. Um, so, so the impression we have is half and half we see from news and also half is what we grew up with. People, um, South Koreans labeling each other as pro-North Korea or anti-North Korea. Um, so, so these are, North Korea is an impression to our generation. And, and so, um, it's interesting to see the generation gap, um, sort of aligning with the external factors in a similar way as well. Um, but, but a color to this is that although younger generations do not really care about North Korea, in recent months, I have gotten the most, uh, cacao talk messages than ever, about the possibility of war with North Korea. That was quite interesting from, uh, from yeah. my male friends. They were texting me, are we going, are we, are we going to be conscripted again? Should I escape? Should I immigrate? Um, <laughs> and the, and the girls, um, the, the women uh, who maybe have husbands, they were really actually afraid of something like Ukraine happening to us. Um, so, but, but from impressions and headlines, Um so, yeah, uh, I think that's something very difficult to catch from polls as well, the exact causes, what they um, get certain ideas from related to something like that. All right. Thank you so much. And, and now we're going to turn to a, uh, a positive view about what potentially could happen. And, um, you know, Dr. Nick Everstadt, we, we often talk about the challenges and obstacles for unification. <clears throat> They're well known and well discussed. But you've written that there are reasons to be a bit more bullish when it comes to unification, particularly in the economic department. So hoping, hoping that you could take us through that discussion well, a bit. Well, well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you for inviting us all here. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think it is anything like a state secret that uh, interest in uh, unification uh, has diminished uh, dramatically in the South in uh, recent decades. I think Sanction has um, illuminated that and detailed that. Uh, the change, I think, really started back in the financial crisis in late 97 and early 98, when uh, the, um, the dire state of public finance in South Korea uh, brought to attention the, um, uh, the nature of the burdens that uh, taxpayers and citizens might have to assume in South Korea if there were a unification with the with the North. And of course, all of that anxiety uh, uh, unfolded in the mirror of German unification, which turned out to be a very expensive proposition for um, West German taxpayers. I mean, it was almost a miraculously easy and simple process compared to what one could have imagined, but it was still a very costly proposition. Um, I just want to uh, show in a few slides that the world has changed an awful lot since the financial crisis of 97. And, um, and as, a, uh, as a financial proposition, uh, unification may be a little bit less scary and a little bit less unthinkable than common impressions would suggest. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? I'm not going to um, I'm not going to read my talking points here because I think that would count as death by PowerPoint. <laughs> but I'm um, I, I do want to suggest that uh, there are reasons to be a little bit less uh, frightened by the financial aspect of uh, some possible future peaceful drawing together of the two Koreas into some sort of economic integration. And one of the reasons is just because South Korea is so much richer today, so much more economically successful today than it was back uh, during the financial crisis a generation ago in 97, 98. Uh, and let's go to the next slide, please. Um, you know, North, North, Korean data are um, 
almost non-existent for making comparisons between North and South Korea economically. You know, I've, I've batted this around for a long time myself. And in trying to find something that would give a fair comparison of the two states, the closest thing that I can come to is looking at international trade data, the reports on trading partners about how much the two different Koreas have sold and bought. And those are obviously not perfect, and we can think of all sorts of reasons they wouldn't be perfect. But look at this picture. Look at what's happened with the two Koreas over the period from 1960 to the present. This is their share of global uh, exports. We don't remember this anymore, but there was a time when North Korea was more productive economically on a per capita basis than people in the South. I mean, this is almost impossible for young people to imagine, but that's that was uh, the case right after the ceasefire. But the South's performance eclipsed the North, and the North, uh, well, the North has been in long-term failure. Uh, and l- let's look at the next one, please. And you know, if you put North Korea's uh, performance in international perspective, uh, the state whose uh, decline. North Korea's exports most closely mirror is Zimbabwe. And then, of course, uh, after the nuclear crisis, North Korea's uh, exports fell off the earth, not entirely in real life because there's a lot of uh, illicit trade. But you you get the point that you don't want to be in the Zimbabwe club. Um, But this is not because there is something defective about people in North Korea. It is a, they have the worst business climate of any country in the known world. And I'll show you that in the next slide, please. Um, b- business climate is a bit subjective. I mean, you have to ask people what they think of it. It's not a nice, easy thing to measure. But w- you know, time and again, if you look at what people say in the outside world about, um, quality of institutions, quality of policy, what what we call economic climate. North Korea's economic climate is at the bottom of any country that's measured. So it's really not a surprise that the performance of the economy has been so miserable for such a long period of time. That's not a verdict on the subject population of North Korea. People in Korea are pretty enterprising, they're pretty smart, uh, pretty hardworking. We can even see that sort of enterprise and smarts applied by the North Korean government in ways that we don't really appreciate, like sanctions busting and cybercrime and uh, insurance fraud internationally and things like that. It's just using your powers for, uh, you know, what Superman would say, it'd be using your powers for evil instead of for good. But the Uh, The reason that North Korea hasn't flourished is not because there's something defective about the populations, there's something defective about the government they've been living under for three generations. Uh, So, next slide, please. Um, What what people in internationally, and maybe even people in South Korea, don't always understand is how rich South Korea has become through dint of the South Korean population's own hard work, enterprise, and foresight, and on the whole, successful policy. And you can see that in this uh, in this slide here. And let's look at the next one, please. Um, let's say that uh, let's say that the average per capita wealth in North Korea is zero. Um, some people might say it negative, but let's say it's zero. Um, if you had a magical coming together uh, right now of the two Koreas um, with South Korea's existing wealth and zero wealth in the north, the average wealth for the peninsula as a whole would look kind of like um, you know somewhere in the uh, in the European range today somewhere in the Mediterranean European range. That's not a poor country. That's like a developed OECD country. That's an affluent society. And look at the next one, please. Next slide. 
Um, actually, North Korea's um, wealth, uh, North Korea's wealth would be higher on a per capita basis than that of Germany a decade after it unified. So if there were a magical drawing together of the two Koreas now, North, North and South Korea together would have a higher level of wealth simply due to the wealth of the South Korean population on a per capita basis uh -huh. than United Germany had uh, a decade after the unification, just to put things in perspective. So it's not as if there would be no money to finance a reconstruction. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, an additional point just to mention is that if the business climate were propitious, and that's a gigantic if, and we can think of a lot of reasons for why it might not be possible to make a good business climate for a reunifying or a unifying peninsula. But if it were possible to make a propitious, attractive business climate, there is a lot of money sloshing around in the world economy today that could be applied to making this project work. Um, you can see how much uh, is available in terms of global direct foreign investment today. That stuff can move around from one country to the next. And let's look at the final slide, please. There's Again, there's even more money for so-called portfolio investment. Around. So my, my take-home, I think, is that the situation is very different today from, uh, from a generation ago. On the one hand, the gap between North and South Korea is even bigger now than it was uh, economically a generation ago. I'd kind of assume that it's going to continue to widen as long as North Korea maintains this worst-in-class business climate. It's not the fault of the North Korean people. Uh, there's a lot of money to finance a reconstruction if people have the appetite or the will for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, I'm all fired up about unification now. Uh, you know, this is, it's become such a negative climate on this topic. So I, I think it's really refreshing to, to hear your perspective and just this larger historical context. And, you know, when people cite reasons for their antipathy towards unification, typically the, the political burdens are, are put up there first and then, then quickly behind as, as, a uh, uh, a very, significant reason is the economic burden that it would pose. But this perspective, I think, is quite illuminating in that over time, it would actually become an economic benefit to the peninsula. And uh, Tom Byrne and I wrote a, wrote a piece uh, about this topic adjacent, uh, talking about how the IMF is really the gateway to change for in order to for North Korea to be able to tap those private capital markets, uh, because South Korea can't do it alone. Um, but if it's a good investment, then the world will come to it. Uh, so any follow on thoughts there, Nick? Well, I mean, I was just showing some very obvious big picture, uh, concepts here. The devil is in the details, of course. And one of the things I didn't mention, of course, is the IMF or the possible need for other new international financial institutions to help facilitate investment, portfolio investment, direct foreign investment, borrowing, lending, and all the rest. And there's many a slip between cup and lip. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there, there may be all sorts of reasons that one couldn't grasp the opportunities that I'm trying to, you know, kind of broadly outline here, not the least of these being, by the way, that the North Korean government has been so uh, resolutely opaque about its own miserable economic performance 
I mean, it yeah. had one failed date with the IMF back in the 1990s, yeah. as yeah. you may recall, yeah. and they couldn't even get to the dance, uh, which is the beginning of North of IMF membership applications, where the uh, where the applicant government gives a statistical communique to the IMF. They couldn't even get that far. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> there are plenty of barriers here. Right. But uh, but I, I'm just hoping that I could show some of the um, some of the other aspects that we don't always consider. No, I think this is really illuminating. Thank you so much, Nick. And and yeah, I recall that uh, that episode in '97. And the IMF was eager to provide some kind of business training and had it all set up to do it in China. And then the North Koreans just never showed up, even well, though they themselves expressed interest in it. Well, one of the rather unpromising uh, aspects of the IMF and then the World Bank's uh, visit was when the uh, when the World Bank uh, representative explained uh, what the World Bank did. Uh, some of the officials in the audience first question was, "What happens if we don't pay you back?" <laughs> yeah, that's that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, uh, that, that explains some of the problems in the domestic North Korean banking sector then. Um, all right. So let's go to one of our lightning round questions. I want to pivot to Chelsea for some of our audience questions because we've been getting a bunch. Um, and, and that's, I want to talk about South Korea's change, recent change in unification policies for the first time since 1994. The national community unification formula will be changed uh, and it will now emphasize a liberal democracy based unification. Um, so this recently came out in the news. So I wanted to ask for what is the significant uh, significance of of this development, and what impact is it likely to have? Dr. Lee, Art? this is yours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, and most importantly, in the current situation, uh, the reason the. Uh, how can I say this? The South Korea is very deeply polarized country, but the official unification plan, the national community unification formula is a very rare example of policy that has supported by progressive and conservatives. So it is not the first time government uh, suggested we need a new unification plan. It has been done since early 2000. But why the, we, we haven't changed the unification plan? Be, because it takes a lot of effort to formulate this plan. And it, it, this plan has supported by uh, both parties. It was created by the conservative parties in 1989 and finalized in 1984 by conservative uh, president. And after that, the progressive government supported the unification plan. Mm -hmm. So the, the important thing is, it is very difficult to create something like this. Not the content, but the people's consensus yeah. and support from both the polit political ideological uh, ideologies in South Korea. South Korea, as you know, is as polarized as the United States now. So I, 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 I don't know how the UN government would do it. Will he able to get the support from the oppositional party? I don't think he is trying to do that. So the, I believe that if UN government wants to come up with new new unification plan. The most important thing is to go through a deliberative process that gains the consent of the entire South Korean public, including the progressive opposition. Without such a process, any new government after Yoon will make a new unification plan of each own. Mm. Thank you. I'm just going to add that even if um, the government um, succeeds in gaining some sort of consensus adjacent, um, it could be seen as a moot point. Uh, it takes two to tango. North Korea did this preemptive uh, strike against uh, the concept of unification. Um, so it will be very difficult for whoever's tapped to actually come up with the content. The wording would be very, very difficult to make yeah. it sound still, still relevant 
to the Korean Peninsula situation. But on the other hand, this is also a very good opportunity for the UN administration to push forward with whatever framing that they wanted to go with, knowing that North Korea is just not interested in whatever format that they will come up with anyways, probably. Yeah. Well said. Okay, let's transition to our audience questions. We have so many. Chelsea, over to you. Hi, everyone. So um, I want to start off with a question from Sonia Heppenstall. Um, she asks, of all the many reasons why Kim Jong-un would decide to scrap North Korea's stance on unification, what do you think is the most important one? And do you think Moscow or and or Beijing were consulted or at least informed of the decision in advance? So how... How aware were Moscow and Beijing of this? And what do you think is the most important reason for North Korea deciding to abandon unification? I will go first. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, well, the, the minister of the unification of South Korea uh, said several things, most of the internal regions in North Korea, why for why Kim Jong un scrapped the unification plan. But I think it has been brewing in North Korea for several, several years since, especially since the failure of Hanoi. I know the Korea doesn't see any reason for the, they, they don't have any need for the South Korea. They, they, they knew that as long as they have nuclear weapons, South Korea will not and cannot uh, cooperate with North Korea. We cannot have, with, have North Korea with the economic development or anything, and they cannot give up, give up their nuclear weapons. So they, they, have, they don't see any reason to have communication or any the, the linkage with South Korea. And that's, and Kim, Kim, for Kim Jong-un, uh, he needs some kind of shock therapy for us. For South Korea and the uh, United States, so that they have, he can have the attention of the United States. I think that's the major reason why North Korea is abandoning its nuclear the unification concept. Yeah, thank you. Are there any other thoughts from Chung Min or Nick? Sure. Um, remember that. Um, remember that people are punished severely in. North Korea for watching South Korean videos, for talking with a South Korean accent, uh, for, you know, for, for kind of being interested in or emulating what they, what they know about or hear about or think, suspect about the South. Um, that's a competition that DPRK has lost. I mean, that, that horse is gone. And uh, the drawing together of the uh, the drawing together of the two Koreas uh, culturally at this point may be viewed as a big loser for uh, DPRK leadership. I mean, we have to remember that what goes on in domestic politics, and even in a totalitarian dictatorship, you have politics, you've got human beings, you've got politics. Um, what goes on in North Korean domestic politics is something that for the most part, we are not allowed to see. Um, as far as uh, China and Russia are concerned, I mean, uh, one of the tragedies for, uh, for the DPRK regime since the nineteen um, since the nineteen nineties, it's been the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union and the end of the play Moscow against China game for aid. I mean, that's that's a big uh, that's been a big problem. The United States was being groomed uh, in some eyes in Pyongyang as the replacement for the Kremlin. Uh, that never obviously worked out too well. Uh, I would. I would imagine that if there were discussions uh, with uh, the Kremlin and with uh, Beijing about this change in uh, ideological doctrine, this important change in ideological doctrine, that uh, Pyongyang's calculations would be would have been exactly towards trying to figure out how to play the two governments for more aid. 
Yeah, great point. Thank you. And um, Chung Min, do you have any anything to add here? It's a it's a difficult question. Um, but but um, my immediate thought is I think it's a long shot. Uh, justification project towards an ultimate goal of being recognized far in a faraway future as a normal state and a nuclear power. Um, on the road towards that, I think uh, being roped in the unification idea um, and, you know, having to consult with South Korea on, on a lot of stuff uh, on the way there, they might have just seen that as an inconvenience maybe. Um, but but that's just an immediate thought. I'm not sure how exactly the causality would be, but I do see a lot of hints now and then um, on North Korea trying to uh, position itself as a responsible and a normal state, a state, not a, a not one part of just the peninsula. Uh, it might be part of that sort of um, attempt, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, kind of more of a long-term calculus. We can't be sure like right now, but... Yeah, I think that's a really great point. Um, we have another question from Jacko Swetslu at NK News, um, which is related to Sanction's um, presentation on um, more a bigger appetite among the South Korean public for different ideas of what unification could look like. And so Jacko asks, is there a chance that um, North Korea's change of policy or line could lead to eventual mutual recognition of the two Koreas and continued um, peaceful coexistence, which um, similar to what happened in Germany, which we talked about. And if so, if this like peaceful coexistence is possible, do you guys think it's more or less likely that there would be increased hostility and actual military conflict on the peninsula? Thank you for the question. And it's a very difficult one. First of all, the unification in South Korean constitu constitution so the officially we cannot just abandon the idea of unification south korean government it will be unconstitutional for the south korean government if we if we do the same thing with the kim jong-un does but at the same time people's view on north korea unification is rapidly changing as i shown as i've shown you with my the slides but the nationalism and the history is very resilient. I don't think it will be uh, easy for the South Korean people to give up the idea of inefficiency, even though they don't like the idea, they, they don't see anything good in the future of unification. So we will, for, for the foreseeable future, we will stick to the the maybe hopefully it's dream of unification, uh, but uh, we will continue to try to, to try to have the unification with North Korea. And one thing about, one good thing about dictatorship is that they all, they can always change back. Kim Jong-un just <laughs> abandoned the 70 year legacy of his grandfather and father. And he can always say that I was wrong, let's go back to the a former state, and he will be okay with that. So hopefully, North Korea can do that. Thank you. I just wanted to chime in um, on something that Sangshin just said. Um, this will actually become an added uh, complication for South Korean domestic politics as well, because North Korea issue and unification issue was one of the go-to weapon um for uh politicians on both left and right to attack each other um including their views on unification and now that north korea is like no we don't want to be friends with you either left or right the liberals would be uh struggling to figure out a new way to position themselves when it comes to peace and unification and on the right they they lost one of the you know strongest weapons to attack the liberals um but i just wanted to add that there when it comes to unification um as a goal for the, the for the right wing, I'm seeing very interesting trend in um, South Korean conservative media editorials, including Chosan Yeolbo. I think in January, I believe, or February, um, they said something like, "This is a moment for the right wing to take back the unification rhetoric and discourse um, to lead it towards a liberal democracy based unification." Um, so it does seem like they're not willing to give it up, one way or another. We, yes, we are missing a 
crucial um, piece of evidence, Jocko, I think, which is what how the regime is explaining this major ideological shift to the domestic population. And if we had that evidence, we would have a lot more of a basis for hypothesizing about whether this is a uh, an intentional shift towards let's call it coexistence, unfriendly coexistence, coexistence with uh, your main enemy um, state, or whether this is a shift in tactics and a continuation of the same approach that the Kim family regime has maintained uh, since, uh, you know, let's say, June of 1950. Uh, I'm not sure if I can say this. I I just one thing. When we say unification in South Korea, each political faction have kind of used unification as their own code word. For the conservative, unification means uh, unification by absorption. For the pro North Korean uh, left progressive faction, unification means the nationalistic unitary system without. United States presence in South Korea for the uh, the middle uh, liberal uh, liberal faction in South South Korea like to, like the Moon Jae In government Moon Jae In government hate to use the term unification they try to use the peace and so the, the, for the for them the idea of unification is peaceful co- coexistence unification as a unitary system is very long term goal they they want to have they create the environment for North and South Korea can coexist. So when we we have to dip, understand how unification has different meanings for the different, different political factions in South Korea. Thank Great you. Point. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that point? All right. Well, I think that is time for this program. Um, I want to thank you guys as well as our audience for tuning into this discussion Um, and also our team, Jonathan, obviously for moderating and our team here at the Korea Society helping things run smoothly on the tech end. Um, If you've enjoyed this discussion, please head over to the Korea Society website where you can see our past programs and also sign up for our upcoming programming as well. Um, And uh, please join me in thanking our guests. Uh, Thank you all. It's been a pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.